Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, in this Google Hangout. This is the first of a series of Hangouts we're doing here at New America, in which we'll take students and everyone else listening, because, you know, we're all students at heart, what it's like to actually work in government and at companies. And we're excited to begin this series with the State Department, a pretty big government agency. Uh, and it's sort of like a, it's a habit or a fun cliche to criticize government, but we should all know that government is filled with people, so we should know what it's like to work inside as a person. I'm Buzz Hogan, the managing editor here at New America. I'm the least important person on this Hangout. The two most important people are on the other side of the line. Doug France, the Assistant Secretary of Public State for Public Affairs. Say hi, Doug. Hi. Great to be here. Thank you. He was a reporter for over 35 years with various publications and joined State in 2013, although he did tell me earlier today State was not his first government job. So uh, that proviso. Uh, also joined by Anne-Marie Slaughter. Hello, Anne-Marie. Hi, Fuzz. He is among other things, my boss, but mainly the current CEO and president of New America and the former director of policy planning at the State Department. A reminder to everyone listening, uh, we'll be taking your calls, taking your calls, sorry, taking your tweets, how old am I? Uh, Doug and Anne-Marie will be answering your questions, so please tweet at us using the hashtag StateHangout or tweet at us at New America. So Doug, I'm going to start with you. You covered both Iraq wars and the war in Afghanistan. Um, and you had you had a lot of familiarity over your time as a reporter with government workers. So what misconceptions did you have about working for government that were resolved when you started working uh, on the Hill, right? And then I guess from the Hill to state, how did that change your opinion of working inside government? Um, yeah, I had I had a, a lot of opinions about about government workers. Um, Mostly, they we were adversaries, in my view, um, and I don't think that's necessarily the way it should be. But but I was a an aggressive and and perhaps overly skeptical reporter. I was a reporter and editor for 37 years, and somebody said to me the other day, "Well, you're a recovering journalist," and I said, "No, I'm not a recovering journalist. You never recover from being a journalist." Um, <laughs> And so I do bring that, that mindset to, to government when I went to work for uh, then Senator John Kerry on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 2009. That was my first step out of, out of, out of uh, the, the broad uh, newspaper world. And it was, it was a big step in a, lot, in a lot of ways. And I think one, thing, one of the things that struck me then and has been reinforced since I came to state a, a little over a year ago was that Reporters don't know quite as much as they think they do. <laughs> I'm yeah. a former reporter. I'm nodding my head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I say that after 37 years of thinking I knew everything as a reporter. Um, and, and so I, I think we don't, we don't, reporters don't know everything they think they do. What I saw, though, was in, particularly in the Foreign Relations Committee and, again, as, as the public affairs um, head here at, at the State Department now is that Good reporters understand that they don't know everything, and they come with an open mind and an open notebook. And I hope I was that kind of reporter. Sometimes I know I wasn't. But, you know, so, so what I've learned as a government official is that I need to deal with reporters who think they know everything and persuade them that they don't. But I also am more comfortable dealing with reporters who come really wanting to know, wanting to understand something. You know, you've had great reporters through New America. Steve Call, who, uh, who preceded Anne Marie, was maybe the best reporter of his generation. And Steve is a guy who knew that uh, no question was a dumb question. And, um, and I think that, that, that he built trust among government employees. He built trust and persuaded people to talk to him and help him um, because they saw that he came with an open mind and he didn't come with, with, his, with his story written just looking for a quote. So for me, it was, it was a big change to come and sort of be on the other side of that divide. It, it started at the Foreign Relations Committee where I worked for, for three years for Senator Kerry, and then I've gotten a full immersion in it here at the State Department because um, when I came in September 2013, it seemed like there was a crisis a day, and it's only gotten worse since then. So yeah. it really means full immersion. So I, I want to, I uh, at the risk of dancing on a journalistic, uh, head of a journalistic pen, I'll follow up on that later, but I want to get to Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, you made a transition from academia, uh, dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, uh, to director of policy planning at, at the State Department. 
Um, how did that transition? Did you have the same kind of transition as Doug did, or is there, were there other learnings you had when you went from one to the other? Well, let me start just by saying, Doug, I couldn't agree more about your description of Steve Call as possibly the greatest uh, journalist of his generation. There were big shoes to fill here when I came to New America, but I had a, a I was asked all the time, what's the biggest difference between New America, between academia and government? And that would be a you know kind of icebreaker anybody I would meet in Washington. And over time, I started saying. It's, it's really very simple. In academia, you are rewarded for coming up with very big ideas and attaching your name to them so tightly that whenever someone thinks of that idea, they think of your name. And that's how you get ahead in academia. And in government, it's exactly the opposite. If you come into a uh, bureaucratic meeting and you say, I've got a big idea, let's reinvent X, you're done. That No one will listen to you at all because Bureaucracies don't work in big ideas. Your job is to take a big idea and to chop it into bite-sized, digestible chunks, and then to convince other people they thought of them. Because the other piece of it is, it's the old line, you know, you can get anything done in Washington if you don't take the credit for it. And as, particularly at, at policy planning, I had no operational authority, no budget to make things happen. My currency was to basically come up with stuff and then convince other uh, regional secretaries or functional assistant secretaries that really it was a great idea and I'd be happy to co-sign a memo to the secretary making it look like they certainly had thought of it as much as I had. So that's, in a nutshell, the biggest difference. Well, the, the, the binding theme there then is, uh, what I often, when I left journalism, although I still feel like I'm, I have a hand in it, is that folks, and folks don't realize how much happens inside government that journalists never know about and therefore the public doesn't know about. Um, and that journalists think they've discovered something but often it's what's sort of bubbled up in the top of a very, very long process. So wrap those two together in terms of also we tend to therefore think not only this is the sum total of what government does but also to Anne-Marie's point, this is who did it, right? So Doug, talk to me about, or either one of you talk to me about that dynamic of there's so much more that happens inside a government agency than anyone ever knows about. Well, there is, that's for sure. I get here, this is the uh, first job I've had in a long time where I had to be up very early in the morning. I'm at my desk at 7.30 and usually I have a, a stack of classified documents on my pay, on my desk, and I look through those and s probably almost every morning I look at those documents and I think, holy smokes, there's a great story. <laughs> a journalist would love to know. You know, and, and I've disciplined myself, fortunately, so I can stay out of jail, if nothing else, not to, to act on that and not to share that information. But, you know, it's just the first thing in the morning is what I, is I see how much people don't know. And, you know, sometimes you wish people would know. And sometimes, classified stuff aside, my job is to help journalists understand how much they don't know and to help them get the facts right. I mean, I deal with a lot of sort of mainstream journalists as the assistant secretary. I don't do the briefings. Um, I don't do that sort of thing. But but if we have a particularly major issue, if we have a big story, you know, I'm the, I'm the one who, who calls them up and talks to them, sometimes on background, rarely on the record because I'm just a staffer. You know, but, but my job there is to share with them what I can of that bigger picture and to help them before they write or before they go on television or on radio, help them understand the issues. And so I think that's where my background as a reporter and editor makes me a valuable member here at the, at the, at the State Department. But there is a ton they don't know, and, you know, a lot of it is, is all for the better. You know, a lot of it is, is the sausage getting made, and, um, you know, ideas in bite-sized in bite chunks is uh, what Anne-Marie said is exactly right. Although, in this bureau, since I took over, I've, I've tried to push for big ideas. And we, we've accomplished some big things. It's darn hard, as you know, Anne-Marie, and as anybody who's worked in a bureaucracy like this knows, it's darn hard, but it can get done. You know, there are, there are within an organization like the State Department, within any bureaucracy, there are centers of excellence. There are places where they really do want to get things done. And some days it feels like I'm fighting an uphill battle to get that done. 
but but we have accomplished some things, and it's it's been very it's, that that is extremely satisfying. But but you're exactly right. You you never want your name attached to anything because that is that is a death sentence for you and your idea. Right. Well, I'll, I'll come in on that, Fuzz, if I can. Sure. I agree that you can get some big things done, and and the the great satisfaction of government is let's you know for every ten things you try to do. You may only get two done, or done at the scale you want, but when you succeed, you're aware that you had an impact that you could never get in even the very best private organization, because it is the United States government and it is enormous. So when uh, you know Secretary Clinton absolutely wanted to elevate development so that it was on a par with diplomacy, something that will probably take a generation to happen. That's a big idea. We were able to get it, you know, significantly down the track in a way that I don't need. I my name's not attached. I mean, or if it is, it's you know a, a, the the executive director of a report. But when you look back, you think you know putting that time in for all the frustration was completely worth it. Let's get more into the uh, what it's like to work in government. That's a great segue to what it's like to have those sort of delayed reactions. Um, but in a different context altogether, Amory, uh, one of the reasons most folks know your name is the article you wrote, Why Women Can't Have It All. About still can't have it all. Say it again? Still can't have it all. Right. Still still can't, still can't, why women still can't have it all. Thank you. Uh, is that a problem unique to government? No. Goodness. <laughs> no, in many ways, actually, government can be uh, very good for parents, uh, for men and women, because it, for many, many people in government, the hours are quite regular, and that's critical. Uh, so there are large parts of government where we absolutely still need paid uh, family leave, because you have people, you know, the U.S. federal government has no maternity leave. Uh, you have to borrow from your vacation days. You have to steal, you know, borrow, you try to get others to lend. But once you get through that, there's there are lots of ways actually in which government is much better than private corporations. Where it's extremely difficult is the level that Doug serves, that I serve, assistant uh, assistant secretary and up, and probably uh, deputy assistant secretary, where you're a political appointee and you're at the beck and call of the secretary, but more importantly, you're at the beck and call of the world. Uh, if you're in the State Department. And the world does not wait on you. As I always said, Secretary Clinton was very sympathetic to the fact I was commuting with teenage sons back in Princeton, but she couldn't tell Egypt to hold a revolution until I got back on Monday. So at the at the political level, my my point to to parents was understand that you are not going to see your family. It is very valuable to do this and there are some things we could do to make it better. You could have the ability to see classified documents at home, for instance, which would make a big difference. But you know, you got to make a deal with your partner that says, "Okay, you're carrying the load for one year or two years, and then basically you got to get out if you want to to have a to be a parent and be, be the kind of high-level political professional." Awesome. We're going to go to one of our Twitter questions again. Uh, hashtag State Hangout. Tweet us at New America. Dylan Guthrie asks, um, "This is sort of one of the great promises of this of this hangout." It's my dream to be a foreign service officer with state. Uh, he's a little early on the take. He's a college freshman, but good <laughs> for her. Uh, what are the things that state looks for on a resume? And I, I, I'm assuming the answer to the next question is yes, foreign languages. Having briefly dabbled, one of the many non-careers in my life was taking a state department exam. It's a, re it's a requirement, isn't it? Yes, uh, well, yes. Uh, although the State Department also has an extraordinary ability to teach you foreign languages uh, as you get deployed other places, but absolutely, you want language uh, languages. You want cultural competence that to show that you can cross boundaries. Those don't always have to be across uh, countries. You might be growing up Hispanic or. Uh, Asian American or whatever in an American city and cross those cultural boundaries uh, just as, as much. But what we call cultural competence, language, judgment, uh, an ability to uh, adapt to change very quickly because you're going to be rotating uh, every three years, uh, those are things that people want. But I would also say lots and lots of very successful foreign service officers come in in their early 30s 
uh, and have had a whole career, at least a mini career, uh, before they apply. So you can apply right out of college. If you don't make it, apply again when you're, you know, in your late 20s, early 30s. That's a very fertile ground for FSOs. What's the What's the latest? How, how late in your career? Don't worry. Personal, you know, present company accepted. But I've got a colleague of mine who's about, if not older than me, sort of in his 50s, thinking about just starting out in, as a career in foreign service. What would he, he or she need? You are. Oh, wow. So I don't know. I mean, Doug might know. I, I don't know of foreign service officers who've come in any later than, say, their mid-30s or late 30s. I'm not going to say there aren't any. And I know there are plenty of Peace Corps volunteers, uh, that 10% of Peace Corps volunteers are now in their 50s. Uh, so, the, you know, there is there is room there. But I, uh, for FSOs, I'm not sure after, say, your mid-30s or late 30s. Oh, there, yeah, there, are, there are exceptions, certainly. Um, my last special assistant uh, was a guy named George Matthews who had a career as a producer at CNN and NBC <laughs> and came in in his mid 40s, um, and he's he's terrific. You know, so I, I don't think you know there's an upper age limit perhaps in terms of energy. I probably couldn't do that kind of job right now, but but I don't. There's there's no set statutory age limit, um, and so you'll get you'll get people older. But what what Anne Marie said about people who've had sort of mini careers is I think important. Some people come in right out of out of university or right out of graduate school and, and they're they may be terrific and they probably are, but you know, I look for people, you know, not that I'm hiring FSOs, but when I'm look for, for somebody to hire, I look for somebody with some real world experience too. So that that certainly can't help. And and I just want to back up for a minute if I can, Fuzz, to mm -hmm. when Emory was listing the characteristics you're looking for. I would add a very important one, and that is curiosity. Yes. Foreign service officers have enormous opportunities to travel the world, to do different jobs, and if you're curious, you're going to be successful. And that's the same the same top characteristic that I always ask for in journalists when I was managing editor of the LA Times and hiring people. You know, you get so many great applications, but I look for the people who had demonstrated curiosity. And I think, like in journalism, in the Foreign Service or as a civil servant at the State Department, if you're curious, you're going to be, have a far better chance of succeeding. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm going to one more big question. Innovation. Uh, then, how do you foster innovation in a entity as large, in an organization as large as the State Department? Is it best done through big projects or best done through piloting innovation and then pointing to the single example of success? Um, it's a reputation challenge that the government has after healthcare.gov, but what's the best way to feel like you're in an organization that's innovating inside the State Department? Well, I mean, I think you want to do it both ways, frankly. You, you, you know, you want to have the big ideas, but you want to have the small ideas that work their way up also. We had, when the uh, Russians first um, invaded Crimea, illegally, I'm required to add by law, um, we, we wanted to counter the propaganda coming out of Moscow. And so we came up with the idea of doing a playbook. It's a day, it was a daily playbook. We created a communications team to do it. And that playbook had the top messaging lines. It had action items. It had the best quotes of the day from the president or the secretary or Jen Psaki from the podium. It had tweets that we'd sent out, suggested tweets. We tried to keep it under two pages and we sent it to every chief of mission around the world working for the United States government so that they had the message so that they could they could adjust it according to their country or their region you know but they had that central message in one spot on their blackberry that they could thumb through and yes at the state department we do still you do still use blackberries um, they could thumb through it and they didn't have to be a sitting at a computer and they could be walking into a meeting and they would know the top message whether they're in Canberra or Brasilia, or or Kiev, um, you know. So that was a small innovation that has grown, and it's become department-wide, and it's become this really successful and, and rather burdensome uh, issue where we have to put out a playbook for everything that anybody does here now. So we're kind of playbook heavy, and we're trying to roll that back. But it's an example of starting small, and then then moving up and creating a whole new tool for public diplomacy, particularly. For digital diplomacy, which is one of the great innovations that going that's going on at the State Department right now. So 
I would agree with that, uh, and indeed a large part of the way I allowed, I encouraged innovation was providing top cover for the younger people in my office or the, the regular FSOs in my office who had good ideas and just needed a sympathetic boss uh, who would run interference for them, uh, you know, prevent them from being shut down, uh, champion them when necessary, a well-placed uh, sentence at a meeting with the secretary or the chief of staff. Uh, and so one way to do it is really getting out of the way or, or rather creating space. And that's true in embassies as well, in missions, uh, where if you have a really good ambassador, lots of people have good ideas. So the bottom-up way is, is always a good way. I also watched Secretary Clinton hire Alec Ross as her special advisor for innovation, and he had a whole team of technologists who were working on digital diplomacy, or more broadly, how you uh, integrate technology and foreign policy. And so there, she charged him with doing that. He came up with all sorts of great stuff. Of course, he also had to do what I had to do, which was to go bureau by bureau and convince people that these were their ideas or they weren't scary ideas, because you can't really impose something on the bureaucracy top down if you don't do it with intelligence and craft. Cool. I want to move to public diplomacy, bump something both of you are very conversant in, Doug, as Assistant Secretary of State for it. Uh, I want to talk about why it's so important, and then with a very acute example of the past week, um, but Doug, to, I will set you up first with what's, how has it changed, and why is public diplomacy such a growing part of the part of the work? Well, I think it's always been part of the work, Fuzz, but I think we do it a little a little differently now. Um, you know, social media has transformed the global conversation, and there's certainly a recognition at state under under Secretary Clinton, but 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 reinforced strongly by Secretary Kerry and by Rick Stengel, who's the Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, that, you know, we need to be out there, we need to be aggressive and part of the conversation. That's really what it's about. You know, Edward R. Murrow dis gave, described diplomacy, diplomacy best. He was, for, for your younger uh, viewers, <laughs> he was the guy who invented broadcast television news um, during World War II, and he was a pioneer and innovator and, and you know, somebody who's one of the greats of, of all time for journalism. But later in his career, he came to the State Department to work as an information officer. And he told one of those early classes of diplomats at the State Department that when it comes to diplomacy, it's the last three feet that matters most. And that's the three feet between you and the person you're talking to. You know, so now we take that to heart, but we can have that last three feet in a very different way. We can have that conversation as we're having now on a Google Plus Hangout. We can have it on Twitter. We can have it on Facebook. We can have it on WhatsApp. We can have it on SoundCloud, on Instagram. We, you know, we're across a lot of platforms and we've, here in Public Affairs Bureau, we've devoted enormous resources to this and really put some of our very best and brightest people at work here, building on the programs over the previous over the previous four years, and I think we've gotten a whole lot better. And it, and it's very targeted. But I want to put on my journalist hat again. It it's only one tool in our arsenal of of diplomatic tools and of public affairs tools. And in in my in my view, you know, we want to use it, but we don't want to depend on it exclusively. We still need to work with television journalists, radio journalists print journalists, God bless them. We need to be out there across every platform. Social media is easier in a way because you can sit at your desk and do it, but it's it's the diplomats who get out there and talk to people, you know, who, who are at least as important in, 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 in public diplomacy. I would agree with that, uh, particularly on, the, on the, the last point. I would add two things about public affairs or public conversation uh, and one is the tremendous value of have, making it a two-way conversation, and I know Doug knows this because that's what he's doing, which is really one of the things that distinguishes the United States from other countries is that when we put something out, we're not afraid to hear critiques and we're not afraid to engage. So really not just broadcasting, which was Edward R. Murrow, now it is engaging in conversation. Hugely important, and our best ambassadors 
have blogs, have Twitter feeds, have Facebook feeds where they engage back, and that's that's the secret to making social media uh, work. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. and be more right. Yeah. <laughs> The other point is that we can enable other people to talk to each other or find out about each other. So I remember Ambassador Gibbs in South Africa, his Twitter feed, the Pretoria Embassy, essentially was a Twitter feed of great articles about not only South Africa but Southern Africa. And so if you were interested in learning what was going on, not about the United States but about Southern Africa, you were impressed that it was the U.S. Embassy that was enabling that. So curating and, and connecting others is another way to do this. Yeah, and, and this is, uh, I'm going to open up a whole can of worms here because I realize this, what happened in China this week uh, puts this question, of the, there's a very big spectrum of press freedom. We had uh, Chinese uh, Xi Jinping uh, president um, basically blaming the New York Times for their own trouble with visas because of negative coverage. And so it's a difficult situation the State Department finds itself in. China is a big power, as in any country you want to have good relationships with is, is you want to maintain those relationships. But how, what's the role of the State Department in that moment where um, another country, and maybe one as big as China, is behaving that way? And what's the best way to balance the long-term needs with the short-term commitment to press freedom? Well, I, I don't think that the short-term, that the commitment to press freedom is short-term. I think we see that and freedom of expression, which is press freedom writ large, as a core universal value. And it's part of every conversation that Secretary Kerry has with his Chinese counterparts. It's, it's part of every, every conversation we expect ambassadors around the, the world to have. It's part of the conversation that Secretary of Kerry had not long ago when he was in Egypt meeting with President Sisi. Um, he, he raised the issue of the Al Jazeera journalists who are unfairly in jail. You know, that, that is a core American value, and we're going to speak to that. We can balance those values with cooperation. You know, there, there's cooperation, and there's competition, and sometimes there's confrontation. I just had a meeting before I came down here um, with a two-star general from Pakistan who's in charge of their information operation. And it was a very cordial meeting. We have a pretty cordial relationship with Pakistan now. But at the end of it, I raised the case of Declan Walsh, the New York Times reporter who was thrown out of the country. You know, I, I raised it lightly at the end of a conversation, but I brought it up, as I should have. I mean, I'm, there, I'm here to advocate for American values. One of those values is freedom of the press. Because of my previous career, I believe in that strongly. And because John Kerry believes in it, too, he was willing to take a chance on somebody like me as his assistant secretary of state for public affairs. Awesome. Uh, last question, and it's a pretty straightforward one. Sarah Watson on Twitter asks, what's your best advice for a new college graduate, so not a freshman, wanting to get into government? And I guess she means government generally, not just State Department. And uh, I'll have to ask my favorite uh, little part of the world, or a little category of um, of interest is should they be working for a state in a state capital or should they come here to Washington where there are plenty of people like them wanting to do, wanting to do good? <laughs> well, I'll take a crack at that one. So for somebody coming out right now, I think your best bet is to attach yourself to a political campaign uh, and there's no shortage of them and there's going to be a need for people on the ground in every state uh, and if you are happen to be coming out at a time when a, a presidential campaigns are gearing up, or governor's campaigns for that matter, or senator campaigns, but really I would look for the presidential campaigns, that's exactly what you should start to do. You're Which, young. That, that won't brand you one way or the other? You won't be ever forever a D or an R by doing that? Or is that well, just... Well, I mean, so it, I guess I'm assuming that you have a candidate, but by and large... I mean, there are independents who can work both sides of the street in government, uh, and my former colleague uh, Tom Christensen is an independent and will work for either side. They are relatively rare. If you want to go into government as a political appointee, you sort of need to choose your side. Uh, and But, you know, it's it's if you're young and you can survive on pizza and very little sleep for a long periods of time, Campaigns are for you, and honestly, I saw many, many, many young people coming into the State Department in, you know, not the most glamorous jobs, but they got the foot in the door because they'd been uh, working for Secretary Clinton or President Obama on a campaign. 
beyond that, if you want to be in government, my advice would be go to your state capital. I think much more is happening uh, in the states or the cities. If you're in Chicago or uh, San Francisco or LA or New York or Miami, uh, I would go and try to work for the mayor's office, the governor's office. I think that is where you get really valuable on the ground experience and the federal government will still be there later. Doug, last chance, last word. Fair enough description. I mean, I, I looked at, as in, in journalism, I started out at the bottom. I was the, uh, I worked for a twice a week newspaper in a small town in Indiana. Mm -hmm. I wrote most of the stories, took the photographs, and I delivered the papers when the paper boys didn't show up. <laughs> you know, and I worked my way up to be, to be investigations editor at the New York Times and managing editor of the LA Times. But, you know, it took a long time to do that. And I think government is similar. It takes a long time to work your way up. You know, internships, Anne Marie didn't mention that. I think internships, whether you're a student or a recent graduate, can be very valuable because you get a chance to show your stuff. And and we we took we hired interns off of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Yep. Interns to come in here to the State Department, get 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 a pretty good crack at openings. You know, so be willing, as Anne Marie said, to eat pizza and not sleep a lot, but you know, and be willing to to don't expect to be Assistant Secretary of State before you're 22 or 23 anyway. <laughs> well, great. Thanks to you both. Thanks to all of you for joining us on this Google Hangout. Uh, special thanks to the State Department, to Doug and to Anne-Marie. Be sure to read our e-magazine, Weekly Wonk, uh, weeklywonk.org, hot off the presses this afternoon. Follow us on Twitter at New America. Like us on Facebook. And stay tuned for the next Hangout. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Thanks, guys.